Coming up on Tech News Today, who will be the next Microsoft CEO? We got some ideas on that. Also, Samsung's crazy predictions about their own future, and Google wants to make a personal map just for you. All of that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, November 6th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. With over 28 million high-quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 25% off your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use offer code TNT1113. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zachter. I'm Jason Howell. And those are the four parts of the amazing, incredible team that brings you the best, most important tech stories in the day and makes you sound really smart next time you talk about technology, starting with the top 10 stories of the day, the news feeds. <laughs> Reuters reports its sources say Microsoft has narrowed its list of CEO candidates to about five or so people, maybe five and a half, I don't know. Uh, on the list to replace Steve Baumler are Ford's Allen. I'm not leaving Ford, but I'm not going to explicitly rule out Microsoft Mulally. And the itinerant former Nokia CEO and even more formerly Microsoft VP, Stephen Elop. Internal candidates include former Skype CEO Tony Bates and head of cloud and enterprise Satya Nadella. That's been my pick. While the list is shorter now, Reuters insiders say the decision will still take a couple of months to make. So probably no new CEO for Christmas, Microsoft. My crystal ball says that within mm -hmm. about two years, Samsung will unveil phones and other devices with foldable displays. <gasps> Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm just pulling this from Samsung CEO Kwon Oh Hyun, who presented a slideshow in Seoul, Korea, that showed the company's display technology timeline for the next few years, so we could all be Miss Cleos. It got picked up by blog site Sammy Hub. The recently introduced Galaxy Round is curved, but devices with bendable displays are due out in 2014 and foldable screens to debut around the end of 2015. For the first time, Apple published a report detailing how many government information requests it received. The U.S. government requested data from between 1,000 and 2,000 times on 2,000 to 3,000 accounts. Now, Apple disclosed data for 0 to 1,000 of those accounts. Now, these numbers might seem vague in a pretty wide range, and that's why Apple is going to file an amicus brief at the Ninth Circuit Court to support a case for greater transparency with respect to national security letters. The rest of the world asked Apple for information about 719 times. Yeah, on, on average, roughly. Uh, everybody's getting gigabit, we, we wish. Well, Mississippi's getting gigabit. Uh, nine finalists for the rollout of C Spire's gigabit service were announced Tuesday. The service will run $80 a month when it arrives. That's nine city finalists. Meanwhile, Los Angeles announced it will take bids for a company to roll out gigabit fiber to every citizen and business in the city of three and a half million people. The winning bidder will get to provide free internet access at two to five megabits per second and pay at least $3 billion to sell it, uh, to, to roll it out, plus be required to resell access to competitors. Sweet deal. Early next year, Google will start linking Google Plus profile pictures to mobile phone numbers of users on Android. Google accounts that have a verified phone number will be automatically opted in and linked to the associated Google Plus account. So if you're using Android to call or receive a call from a number linked to a Google Plus account, you'll see a profile image without the need to have contact information stored. Again, you can opt out, but opt in by default. Remember, remember the 5th of November, 2013, because that's the day the price of Bitcoin hit an all-time record high of $267.40 on Mt. Gox, the largest Bitcoin exchange. The last record high for Bitcoin was way back in April at $266, which was then followed by an enormous crash in its value. The new record high is due in part to an increased demand for Bitcoin in China. Bitcoin's back. EA announced the uh, game Need for Speed Rivals will release early for the PS4 on November 15th, right along with the release of the console. Originally, both PS4 and Xbox versions were to launch on November 22nd, which was the release date for the Xbox One. And so 
More advantages slip through Microsoft's fingers. Following analysis of the company's Taiwanese suppliers, Cantor Fitzgerald analyst Brian White said in a research note that Apple's sales in October rose by approximately 11% month over month on the heels of the new iPhone 5S, the iPad Air, and new Macs. White says, quote, we believe this October will prove to be the strongest in the history of our Apple barometer, which sets Apple up for a first fiscal quarter in 2014. Uh, very big one. Traditionally, it's biggest quarter of the year. Uh, another company that's doing well is Activision, and they've just shipped $1 billion worth of Call of Duty Ghosts to retail worldwide as of the first day of public availability. Now, that's shipped, not sold, so we're waiting on the actual sell-through numbers. The last Call of Duty, Black Ops 2, sold $1 billion in 15 days. We'll see if Ghosts can beat that. Ghosts will get a boost when the PS4 launches on November 15th, and of course, when the Xbox One launches November 22nd. Amazon just started a new program called Amazon Source that will let independent bookstores sell Kindle devices and accessories. The program also gives these retailers a 10% cut on every book, or every ebook bought on those devices for two years. Amazon hopes to entice bookstores into giving the program a try by offering a worry-free trial that will allow retailers to return the first order they place through Amazon Source within six months if the program doesn't work out for them. Mm, trying to get the indies on board, eh? All right, let's take a uh, break and thank our sponsor for today's show, Shutterstock.com. Maybe you're working on a website. Maybe you're working on a brochure or, I don't know, billboard or newspaper ad or something like that. And you're looking around for some good stock photos. And it can be confusing. Which ones can I use legally? Which ones are not going to cost me an arm and a leg? Let me save you some time. Go to Shutterstock.com. You can choose from over 28 million high-quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips, and they source their images from around the world. They have pros, photographers, and artists in their audience. And they review each image individually for content and quality before they add it to the library. But they're still adding 20,000 images a day to their 28 million. So they, they get better all the time. And they have flexible pricing. You can choose individual image packs or a monthly subscription, whatever works best with the way you're, you're needing stuff. Uh, you can download 25 images a day on that standard subscription, and you download the images in any size. You'd pay just the one price. Sophisticated search tools let you drill down by color palette, by emotion, by gender, all kinds of things. And you can create a light box and save the images you think you might want to use. You can even share those with collaborators on your project. It's a global marketplace. I, I use it a lot. I use it for, for websites that I do. I use it for book trailers that I make. Why not try it today? Go to Shutterstock, sign up for a free account. You don't need a credit card. Just start an account, begin using Shutterstock to help imagine what your next project could be like. Save some favorite images to a light box to review later. Once you decide to purchase, use offer code TNT1113 and new accounts will receive 25% off any package. That's Shutterstock.com for 25% off new accounts. Use offer code TNT1113. Thirteen, And we thank Shutterstock for their support of Tech News Today. All right, we were supposed to have Lance Ulanoff joining us today, but he was, uh, he was taken by a fever, as the Victorians might say. Poor guy's sick. Uh, but filling in gallantly is Mr. Jonathan Strickland from HowStuffWorks.com and ForwardThinking.com. How's it going, John? Hey, Thanks for joining us, man. Going pretty well, yeah. My fever broke last night, so uh, I'm here. No, I'm very <laughs> pleased to be here, obviously. Thank you so much for asking me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on at the at the last second and saving our bacon here. Uh, you know, yesterday we had Jeff Gamet, who looks kind of uh, like Adam Savage, uh, and you kind of look like Jamie. So it's like a MythBusters back to back. You know, I actually uh, I actually wore a Jamie Heineman costume at DragonCon one year and was stopped multiple times and thanked profusely for the <laughs> wonderful <laughs> television programming that I have provided, and it was heartbreaking to let the entire 501st know that I was not actually a myth buster. That's so funny. Jeff was telling similar stories except about Adam. That's a, that's hilarious. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's get into the stories. Let's talk about the short list from Microsoft. Uh, I as with yeah. who, we heard a little bit about the names who's on it, but tell, tell us a little more. Yeah, what's so going here's on. the deal. And Reuters reported that there's five external names and three internal names. So there's at least five people or maybe eight people. I've read varying reports as to what the actual number is. And Reuters doesn't exactly make it clear. So there's a bunch. There used to be apparently 40, uh, not contestants, but candidates to be <laughs> to be CEO of Microsoft. And the top names, like Tom, you mentioned, Alan Mulally, and then there's Stephen Elop, 
Tony Bates, uh, Satya Nadella, and Larry Dignan had a piece on uh, on ZDNet that explained why all, pretty much these why these leaked names are all pretty much poor choices to lead Microsoft, saying Lally Lally potentially has a long learning curve. Uh, Elop, he didn't save Nokia. Good luck with Microsoft. Bates, he's Bates is actually Dignan's pick. He says it's interesting, but the question becomes: Can Tony Bates, who used to be CEO of Skype, can he handle a large, sprawling company like Microsoft? And Satya Nadella, who was the he's currently the head of uh, Microsoft's enterprise group, and also the, their cloud services, he's an interesting candidate as well. Except the same issues as Bates: Could he handle this huge Microsoft? Uh, Jonathan, the the news is the list is shortened, but do you see any surprising names on this list? I don't really see any names that surprise me. I mean, you know, I I understand the various reasons for the people who are on this list, but uh, I have to agree that there aren't any names here that I feel incredibly confident about, knowing that Microsoft really needs to have, at least in my opinion, someone who's truly visionary to, to really kind of turn things around and get multiple divisions moving at a much greater pace than what we've seen uh, over the last maybe, I don't know, five, six years. So I'm not sure that anyone here meets that. But then again, it may be that someone on this list will totally rise to that challenge. And, uh, and I mean, that would be amazing. It's just that when I look at these names, it's you know, thinking about someone who would have to come into uh, a software company who had never worked in that range before. That does seem really daunting to me. Uh, someone who hasn't handled a, a company nearly as large or complex as Microsoft, that's another warning flag. Uh, whoever gets picked, assuming that this is you know, the majority of the list, and there may be names that we aren't privy to that might be more suitable, uh, but whoever gets it is going to have a huge challenge ahead of him or her. Yeah, no doubt. I I don't think any of these names necessarily surprise me, especially not Elop and Mulally. They've been bandied around for a while. Uh, Satya Nadella, I think, makes the most sense personally, mostly because I think Microsoft really needs to become an enterprise company. And I'm not saying they should stop making the Xbox or stop making the Surface even, uh, but maybe they need to seriously consider either dividing that business off or even selling it off as Paul Allen's company anyway have, have suggested would be the best way to go and divide that company in half. That's a little drastic to start off with as a CEO, but Nadella is part of the successful part of the business and he's part of Microsoft. And I think it, I think it's really important for them to promote from within a successful division of the business. Don't promote from within somebody who's, who's in one of the troubled areas, of course. Yeah, but I mean, I, I wouldn't know the first thing about running a company as large as Microsoft, but it seems like it's not just about the future of the company of which obviously cloud and enterprise is a big part of it, which would put Nadella in a good position but also just appointing people in your executive team that can handle the stuff that maybe you're not absolutely number one with. You could argue that that Steve Ballmer didn't do enough of that. Um, that it was a little bit of his way or the highway and, and, and there were some bad choices made because of that. So, you know, it's never really a one man or woman team in these sorts of situations. It's about creating, uh, you know, a good infrastructure where you've got key people that you can depend on. I, I really like what you, what you said there, Tom, about the potential of spinning off some companies from Microsoft. I think that actually could be a really viable approach and, and it would be drastic, but we've seen that happen with companies before where a company just either makes lots of acquisitions and just <laughs> diversifies to the point where there's there's not really any focus anymore. And then it ends up divesting itself of some of those or spinning off some of those companies so that each one can really concentrate on what it does best and truly innovate in that space. That might be the best approach for Microsoft at this point. It's like the Palm approach, right? Spin off software, spin off hardware. That works out real well when they actually wound up spinning up into each other All right, again. go for the, the worst I will, example. I will because Microsoft's actually, trying to really change their, they, they already had that kind of siloed approach. So while they might not have been five separate companies, they had a bunch of warring divisions. So why would you formalize those things? Maybe in theory they could do more. I, 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 Mullally, I still think, even though he keeps saying he's not going anywhere and Ford keeps saying, well, Alan's going to be our CEO for the time being, but they gave him an out. 
I think he's the guy. He has to be the guy. If he could lead Ford in in a, in a industry that was basically being bailed out by the U.S. government, and Ford didn't need that because they were able to to handle that. He was working at Boeing before. He's helped come up with the management structure that's at Microsoft now. He's a natural fit to go into this company to figure out how to get all these people to work on the same page because that's what they really need to do. But if you split them up, that might work, but we've seen that could fail. Maybe we'll see a return to the old days of Microsoft where they had the office of the president and they didn't have a single leader. They actually kind of had a triumvirate of leaders who uh, oversaw the entire company with Bill Black Gates Barry. as kind of overseeing it. You know. <laughs> Well, you know, wow. it worked so well in the past. We worked, uh, right, yeah, we worked right. in BlackBerry and Palm references on the Microsoft story. This is why Excellent. people think we hate Microsoft. <laughs> now we buddy. We don't. Uh, let's start hating on Samsung instead. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, I, we're, it's a, I, look, I think this is a little crazy, but I just want to throw out some of the things that Samsung was saying at their analyst day. This is the second time they've ever done an analyst day. The last time they did it was eight years ago. They're trying to give you a roadmap for the future. This is what Samsung's up to going down the road. Uh, let's start with probably one of the more obscure things. I'm just going to throw it out there. Let me know, crazy or awesome or nah, irrelevant, Exynos coming with a Samsung 64-bit core instead of an ARM core. Now, it would still be an ARM processor with the ARM instruction set, but they would be making their chips more similar to the way Qualcomm does uh, rather than what the way they do right now where the Exynos is, is, is all ARM design. Um, that just, that's probably like the least interesting to most people here. But it, it's a big shift to Samsung saying we're taking more control of the processor. Stun yeah, anybody? I think, uh, I'm not so much stunned as I'm just, I'm curious to see how well this comes out through implementation. I mean, if it's, if it's something where they can really leverage it, where that uh, extra control has a meaningful payout, then that's awesome. If it ends up being just, you know, it, indistinguishable from previous approaches, I don't see what the real point was. How about AMOLED displays with 560 pixels per inch by next year, 2560 by 1440, and 4K smartphone screens by 2015? Okay, huh? now you're talking. Now you're talking my language. Okay, a 4K phone screen because I don't know about you, but the way I like to look at my smartphone is to have it three millimeters away from my eye. Okay. And at that at that distance, you really need high resolution. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's you can't see the pixels. I, I'm, I'm all for high res displays on small devices because it, then it gets closer and closer to something like paper. It becomes easier to read. I do a lot of reading on tablets and smartphones and these kinds of devices, so I'd like that kind of thing. I don't think it's a wild crazy thing because this is the way the industry has been going with displays getting denser and denser on smaller and smaller displays but yes jonathan is right you're not going to notice the difference between this and a 1080p display unless you're literally putting it up against your eye unless you're wearing them as glasses which you might yeah all right well you know i i i'm probably the wrong person to really comment on this because i'm the guy who goes to ces and i look at the 2k display that's set up right next to the 4k display and there's the thing underneath that says, look at the difference. And I look and I say, I can't tell any difference between these two things. I don't know if my visual acuity just isn't precise enough, but uh, yeah. Just so, not standing uh, close enough. That's all. Yeah, that's maybe that's it. Maybe I, maybe I just have to stand directly in front of one and then shuffle right. to the right and look at the other one. But I have a feeling that a 4K display on a uh, on a phone would just be kind of a, it's overkill. I also imagine that would probably put a fairly heavy drain on the battery life. Sarah, let me run the term phone blit past you, huh? It's not just a phone, a tablet, or even a phablet. It's a phone blit. Yeah, it makes me want to gouge my own eyes out, actually. <laughs> with, the, with the handwriting recognition, which makes, apparently, is what makes a phablet into a phone blit. Well, first of all, when I look at it, I read Fawn Blit. Me too. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, but no, that's terrible. I don't like the word phablet. I certainly don't like the word phone blit. Um, I think it's just stupid. You know, the thing, it's funny. Leo and I have talked about this on iPad today when it comes to, you know, screens being, say, 4K or just, you know, better and better. And at a certain point, something that you're holding relatively close to your face, depending on how good your eyes are, I mean, something like 4K would be completely lost on me. And and I think, sure, there's there's certainly technology for technology's sake. And I wouldn't say that, oh, we you know, shouldn't be thinking about 4K displays. But a lot of this stuff just is not going to help anyone as a consumer. So it's hard for me to get excited about some of the stuff I hear because, 
let's be honest. I mean, I, it, it depends on what we can see and appreciate. Yeah, there I think it's niche, but legitimate reasons to have a 4K display, even at that, that small size. I, I don't think they're very common. But what about curved displays? We already have those. Bendable displays are coming next year. And by 2015, foldable displays from Samsung. This is cool stuff. Hold I mean, up this, their phone, put it in their pocket. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I actually, I, I, anything that involves foldable display type technology, I actually think is pretty interesting. It, it's another, not necessarily for a phone, which has its own limited uh, implementation, but if you're talking about wearable computing devices with foldable displays, bendable displays, it opens up a lot of possibilities that I think are really cool. I mean, I, I still kind of want that world where I can get the the touchscreen phone uh, armband around my forearm so that I'm, I'm I'm checking things like this because uh, I'm a I'm a sci-fi geek and that to me sounds like that would be a lot of fun, especially if I could get like a predator skin overlay and then just laugh maniacally whenever I'm checking my phone. That that's something I'm I'm looking forward to. The rise of the clamshell tablet or clablet. As I'm sure it's Samsung. Well, no, nope. <laughs> that's not cool. The S clamlet, actually. No clablets. That sounds like something that you go to the doctor for. I had a case, but thankfully penicillin got rid of it. All right, let's talk about something that involves no funny names, or at least no obvious funny names. Google wants to make <laughs> customized maps for you. Yeah, so uh, the Giga Ohm Roadmap Conference is happening uh, this week in San Francisco. And speaking on stage at the conference were a couple of folks from the Google team, Jonah Jones, who's a user experience designer at Google, and Bernard Seafeld, who is a prod product manager for Google Maps. And they had some really interesting things to say about how Google Maps will evolve in the future. They both said, in the past decade, really, we've spent all of our time digitizing what exist as paper maps you know you've got you've got google street view all of that stuff is part of making something like a map accessible from a variety of of devices digitally so they say now map designers can add detail that customizes the experience based on your location as somebody looking up a map and other signals about you so it's kind of like dynamic maps rather than just something that's a static map where the only thing dynamic about it is where you are placed uh, in relation to that map. Uh, quote, uh, this was coming from Jonah Jones, quote, when we combine the location with other data we have, we can actually build a new map for every purpose or every location, a very specific map that no one has ever seen and won't be there again because it was just created for this one purpose. I love the idea of this. So for example, Let's say you're looking at a map of, you know, New York City. When you zoom out, there are certain locations, you know, certain um, uh, neighborhoods of New York or certain businesses that might stay highlighted, right? You get you get less of those as you as you zoom out. Google chooses which businesses are more important historically, but if you start considering who is looking at this map, uh, have I checked in somewhere? Have I previously searched for certain things in a certain part of town? Google could change or re-rank labels depending on the person so that, again, the map becomes more relevant to you. And then Google possibly wouldn't always even have to show you a map. It might know eventually enough about your habits. Hey, you're at the airport again. You're probably just looking for your flight time. You don't actually need to see a map at all. So your location becomes more like a search query rather than just something where you're trying to navigate around. Jonathan, what do you think? Dynamic maps, future of mapping? I, I love this idea. This is one of those ideas that where it, it, the internet is starting to anticipate my needs. You know, we always have heard things about like the semantic web where the, we don't, we need to put in less and less information to get what we actually need back out, out of it. And this is kind of a, another a manifestation of that that really excites me. For instance, I'm going on Friday, I'm going to a part of town that I very rarely go to. And I'm going right around lunchtime. And uh, if I were using something like this, I would imagine that, you know, to, to map out where I'm going to go, since I'm not familiar with that area, not only would it give me that information, but because it knows, you know, Google knows that I like to search for things like, I don't know, tacos, it might show me eight or nine taco joints that are in that either along that route or around my destination so that I might enjoy a tasty taco after I'm done with my, my appointment on Friday. 
And uh, and ultimately, I would love it where I get to a point where no matter where I go, it's telling me where all the tasty tacos are because there's nothing more heartbreaking than to return from an amazing destination and find out that I missed out on a taco opportunity. Sad. That's a sad mm. tale, let me tell you. I, I looked at this and I, I thought the same thing, right? Like that example of when I, because I, I run into that where you zoom in and you zoom out and you get different things on the map and you kind of have to sometimes figure out what zoom level is showing you the things you want to find on the map. And, I th and they said, well, places you check in could inform how the map shows you things. I check in on Foursquare all the time. I don't think Google has that data. What I want is, and maybe it's a service or a, or a personally provided uh, local storage. I want to be able to say, okay, Google, for your maps, I give you permission to see my Foursquare data, right? I don't want to have to go use Google's check-in to get that information. And maybe that, that points down the road to someday we can be in control of all the information at the different services we use and give permissions and allow it to be accessed or not uh, by, by different services because I, I would love those two to marry up. I don't think they're going to though. Yeah, I think this will be more likely something that'll that'll pair up with things like the, the the Google Now, the cards that you get if you're doing lots of searches and that it'll just start to anticipate what you want based upon search history. Um, I mean, I, I use an Android phone, so I have a, I have a feeling that a lot of that information would be implemented as well. And uh, I mean, I, I can understand people getting a little creeped out by this. Whenever we have technology that's anticipating what we want, there is a little element of sinister kind of overtone yeah. to that. Right. But I, to me, this is just making my life, uh, more interesting and easier. You know, I, I could end up seeing stuff that, I might just pass by otherwise. And while I, you know, talked extensively about tacos, obviously this could be about anything. I'm also, you know, a big fan of theater. And if I were in a part of town where I find out some really innovative theater production is going on, uh, I could stop in and see it. You know, this is the kind of stuff that I'm really excited about. This sort of immersive experience where technology in the real world come together that really kind of makes everything much more of a, a rich experience. I, I'm I'm totally in favor of dynamic maps. Me too. And I mean, I, I I guess I would probably consider myself kind of a map nerd. I mean, some people drive me crazy because they never know where they are because they rely so much on digital maps now. I mean, I really like using a map to, you know, figure out where I am and understand where North always is and that kind of thing. But at the same time, to have a map sort of evolve into something that's, it's not just this thing that will will tell you what your route's supposed to be. I mean, we already see that with things like ways or yeah other other services where it's going to try to get you to your destination in the best way possible based on your situation right at this moment that can just apply to so many other things besides just which freeway to take um it's kind of exciting it doesn't just have to be about tacos you guys are right it could be about burritos or Chimichangas. Enchiladas. Gorditos. Yeah. All right. L.A. <laughs> wants to be one of those gigabit cities. We heard that in the news views. And here's their RFP. RFP stands for Request for Proposal. So the city of Los Angeles is saying, we would like companies to bid on providing gigabit fiber internet to every residence, every business, and every government entity within the city limits of Los Angeles. That's three and a half million people. Uh, that, according to LA IT agency general manager Steve Ranker, he told it to Ars Technica. They estimate it'll cost three to five billion dollars. LA would like the vendor to pay for all of that rollout cost. Uh, also, LA is requiring that, in 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 light of you paying for that rollout cost, you'll also provide free access at two to five megabits per second to every customer you roll it out to. Uh, you can do paid access up to a gigabit per second. And what they want you to provide free Wi-Fi in public areas in LA. Uh, you would be required to sell wholesale access to the internet service you're paying to roll out. And the RFP favors companies who can operate cellular service and data hosting, as well as roll out the gigabit fiber. And Google Fiber probably wouldn't be able to bid on this because you have to roll it out to businesses, not just residences. And Google Fiber chooses neighborhoods and only rolls out to residences. Uh, and they don't really respond to RFPs anyway. So... In return for winning this bid, the uh, company would get the city's contract for all of these services, the cell phones, the data center, the gigabit, all of that stuff, plus the ability to sell triple play services themselves directly to folks. 
it seems like the least appetizing to a company. I mean, I love the idea of wholesale access. I love the idea of free, low-speed internet for people. I think this is great in what it wants to do. But, John, can you imagine any telco or any cable company or, or network infrastructure company chomping at the bit to pay three, and a, three to $5 billion under these restrictions? This, this kind of reminds me of the story about Google opening up Google Glass so that people who are Glass owners can let three of their friends uh, have the privilege of paying $1,500 to get their own pair. Um, this, uh, you know, initially I would balk at this, but then when you think about it, what this request for proposal also means is that whichever company bids on it, should they choose to do so, is going to have a streamlined approach to actually getting the infrastructure put in place in that city. They don't have to work nearly as hard to get all the licenses. They get and all expedited the, permits. You're right. That's a good point. Yeah. So, so when you think of it that way, if you think, well, this means that we could reach these customers and it won't be as huge a headache as it would be if we were to do this, you know, our own way and say, you know, thanks, but no thanks. We're going to do our own uh, pricing plans and, and we're not going to provide free Wi-Fi, it may be that it would be much harder for them to get into that market. So from that perspective, I think there might be some companies that will actually consider this. Yeah, I can see, though, that a lot of companies just kind of staring and waiting for which company is going to put this money up. Uh, I, I, does anybody think like a consortium could do this? Because if you're effectively saying uh, these are going to be dumb pipes, once you put this in, anybody can lease it, you'll be able to switch it. Do you think that all the companies would get together and say, look, we could build this out together as, as, a, as a unit? Possibly, Gosh. especially because of the cell phone part of it, right? Mm -hmm. It maybe you want to partner up with somebody who can provide the cell service. Yeah, I don't know that you would see too many companies that provide the same services or overlapping services mm -hmm. uh, joined together too quickly. It just, to me, that just would be a very complicated partnership. Not saying that it can't happen, but it would it would require a level of cooperation. I'm not sure is um, is is realistic. I just find it hard to believe that one company is going to put up that much money and then theoretically maybe lose access to that either because they're going to be, have to lease it out to other companies and well, then lose that. They would lose access. Well, but the, yeah, they'd have, they, they'd have to. Unlike they'd the make current money off those other companies. I mean, they, it's not like they have to give it away for free. Right, but unlike there. the current infrastructures, if you put it out there, that's only yours, right? If it's if it's Verizon FiOS, it's only Verizon FiOS. Uh, but yeah, they could make money on the other sides. I, I, it would take, unless Google decided to change the way fiber works, that, that might be the company that would do it. They're like, okay, yeah, we, we can do businesses now because this plan is could lead to a lot of big shifts. But it may, making them dumb pipes would be really kind of neat. Well, it would be, dumb pipes would make sense if it was subsidized somehow or the city was like, hey, we're helping to pay for it, so you have to do this. But I just, uh, in, in the current climate, I'm skeptical that anybody's going to plunk down for this. I hope I'm wrong because I live here, but um, I'm just, I'm, I almost wonder if this isn't a bait and switch when they're like, oh, we tried to do it that way. So now we're going to do it in this horribly punitive to the consumer way. Mm. Valve is not going to punish the consumer if they don't use SteamOS. Though. Right. So speaking of IGN, Valve's uh, Greg Coomer said, quote, you won't see an exclusive killer app for SteamOS from us. We're not going to be doing that kind of thing. And the same will apply to third-party titles. Valve's Anna Sweet told IGN that Valve encourages third-party partners to put their games in as many places as possible, including other platforms. She said it would go against Valve's whole philosophy to launch something that's exclusive to Steam OS or Steam machines. Valve doesn't want to create artificial barriers, according to Coomer. He did note that small independent studios who only have the resources to focus on one platform may make games for Steam OS only because uh, that's the only thing they can do. He called that a very different thing. Jonathan, this sounds super altruistic. Like, yeah, hey, everybody should be able to game on this. But is this a bad business idea? Uh, I don't think this is altruistic at all. I mean, I think, it's, I think it's a very savvy business idea because it means that they're not going to alienate anyone who's not going to go with the Steam OS approach. Valve has been really good about developing a community and supporting that community. Uh, you know, the, the, the deals you can get on Steam, of course, are a great example of that. They're really uh, very, very intelligent when they approach this sort of thing. So I think this is another implementation of that because they're saying, look, we, we don't want to, to create this environment where you feel like you are cheated unless you go with Steam OS. Steam OS is a way for them to reach a brand new segment of gaming population that perhaps has been away from the PC gaming world. Maybe they've never even been part of it, but they don't want to alienate that, that earlier audience uh, this is a great move on their part. 
it shows confidence. It shows that Valve is confident enough in their product to say, we don't have to force up artificial barriers to keep people using our product. We think SteamOS is going to compete on its merits. Uh, and it doesn't make sense to go against our whole philosophy of, of being an open-ish platform uh, if, you know, if we, if we put our games out and said, oh, we're only going to make them for us now, uh, the games wouldn't be as successful either. I mean, it's, it's self-interest too. Yeah. The idea well, I mean, we all spend a lot of time arguing that all companies that make games should be adopting this model, that that's really where you get your, your greatest reach. Uh, you keep your customers happy enough. You give them the choice rather than creating choice for them. Obviously, it, it just doesn't work with uh, the way that a lot of these companies are built. But I, I think, I mean, with probably very few exceptions, this is this is the right way to, to run a gaming business. Yeah, when it comes to third-party titles, it seems strange that they wouldn't try to get an exclusive because if you're going to have a bunch of these devices all competing for your dollars and they all have the same games, and now what are you looking at? Are you looking at performance? Are you looking at the established brand? Are you looking at what other things they bring? I know Valve is working on a lot of those uh, television partnerships. I think like rumors or something like the content companies like Hulu to bring access to that. But now they're. Give, I think it's like a distinct disadvantage if they don't have their own exclusives when it comes to their platform. Because why would you get this device over other ones, other than the fact you've bought your Steam game once? Now I could buy a new box. Well, I, I would argue that anyone who who does any research into the console uh, market and looks at PC gaming would would say that I want to have the best experience playing this game and. Time and time again, if you look at reviews and you read about anything that has a multi-platform approach where the title is on the consoles and on the PC, PC version tends to have the, the highest ratings. They tend to be the ones that can really push hardware to its limits, whereas you're, you're intrinsically limited by console hardware. So, you know, I think, I think it is a, a show of confidence. It's, the PC has a distinct advantage in that realm. And by going with the SteamOS approach, you make it a lot easier for people who aren't so savvy when it comes to PC gaming to get into that. So, um, again, I think that this is exactly what they need to be doing. Yeah, as a consumer, I'm totally for this approach, by the way. I might sound really down on it, but, like, this is a good thing. I really You're just asking this. the hard questions, right? right. I mean, yeah, I just right. want to see what you guys think. A business yeah. decision, but for the consumer, nifty. I think it's a great business decision for the confidence reasons I put out there later. But, yeah, no, it's, there, there are lots of different viewpoints on that. A lot of companies would like you to use a second screen. Sarah Lane, is i.tv going to do anything to convince me that I should? Uh, well, I don't know, but possible. ITV, which is i.tv, not to be confused with i e y e t v, um, has acquired Get Glue. Now, this is being reported by TechCrunch. This has not been confirmed by either company. TechCrunch reports that it is an all stock deal which leads me to believe that this is not necessarily a really good thing for Get Glue. Um, Get Glue has raised a bit of money, $24 million since being founded, also had a deal that was worth about $70 million fall through earlier this year. So Get Glue has kind of been on the market for a while, and I've really always paid attention to Get Glue, not really because I'm, I'm that much of a customer of, of the service, but because it was really one of the first second screen apps that, that really came across my radar. And it kept iterating and kept iterating. And, you know, they started out with a four square model, which was a lot of like check into a program, check into a TV show, share where you are, sort of what you're, what you're watching, listening to with friends and other people as the public. You know, like a lot like Foursquare has, uh, that sort of like check-in thing has kind of fallen out of favor. So then it sort of pivoted, get glued did, to more of a TV discovery platform, which I actually liked a lot better. Open up Get Glue. You've got sort of a, you know, it's not not just sort of a place where I could type in a movie and see if it's running on Netflix or perhaps Hulu Plus, or maybe I should go to Amazon where the best price is. But uh, some some uh, some cable schedules as well. So Get Glue uh, had last year had acquired had agreed to be acquired by a competitor, Viggle. It ended up that the deal died because Viggle couldn't acquire enough funding to to get Get Glue. So you might be familiar with Get Glue because I've talked about it quite a bit on the show, but ITV has been around since 2008 and it does very similar stuff. It supposedly connects mobile and tablet users with TV and streaming content. Sounds about right. Uh, it has launched a few versions of an app that provides streaming video option information, a remote control for traditional television. Those can be very cool. 
Interestingly, though, it's also made deals with some big names, Entertainment Weekly, Huffington Post TV, AOL TV to power navigation and discovery of, uh, of videos on their apps. Last year, got a deal to power video discovery for Nintendo's Wii U, which might sound, ooh, that's kind of a big deal, although you could argue that we use people aren't really using that for a lot of video discovery. So I don't know. When I see something like this, I think, well, it doesn't sound like the people at Get Gloom made out with, you know, this is some some great acquisition where everybody got really rich. We talk all the time about whether or not the second screen idea is just sort of doomed because it's not that fun. Jonathan, what do you think? Is it just ahead of its time? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know that it's ahead of its time because I certainly use a second screen in, uh, when I'm watching television pretty frequently, unless I'm watching a really, really bad movie, in which case I have to shut everything down. But otherwise, I, I have a second screen available, and I'm usually... Uh, the, the the problem I run into is usually whatever second screen apps are out there aren't quite versatile enough for what I tend to use my second screen for while I'm watching something else because it changes on a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes it's one of those just simple discussions of, hey, I, I recognize that person. What else have they been in? Uh, sometimes it's, you know, I feel like I've missed out on something. Is there more information about this episode? Did I Did I accidentally skip one? What's going on? So uh, for me, the versatility of just using the internet is what tends to be the solution to that problem. There's not really an app out there that, that encompasses everything I use the internet for when I'm watching uh, television, but I still have a second screen experience. It's just, it's one that I have defined myself as opposed to one that's been defined for me. I, I use a second screen for IMDb. I always, I always would look up actors and go, who is that actor? What else have I seen them in? Uh, and for live events, often it's Twitter. But I don't need another app for that. I did, that's why second screen has never worked for me. However, I will say lots of my friends, lots of people I follow use GitGlue. Uh, and GitGlue has the stickers thing, and there's even Tech News Today stickers and all of that. So it's a cool service. I don't know that much about ITV. It doesn't seem that compelling to me, but... Get Glue seems to be the one to get. And Sarah, I guess it's official now, huh? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, uh, ITV now has on their homepage uh, the acquisition being official. So uh, something that TechCrunch broke. But uh, but yeah, no, it's it's a, it's a real deal. I just, I just wonder, okay, ITV buys a competitor, makes perfect sense. So now you have one company rather than two that do roughly the same thing. And how how do they move beyond? I think the check-in thing, really. I mean, even though Tom, you just said that you've, you you know have enjoyed stuff like that in the past, and you know people also have. I really don't think that's the answer. I I don't. I just don't think that we need an app to say I am watching this football show right now. Yeah, uh, but but there is something <laughs> around They're the called. conversation of that that you know usually I just go to Twitter where it's just like a free for all. Um, there is there is something there is something to better organizing what someone is watching at any given time. Yeah, but gamifying what you're watching on TV and actually wanting to get these little stickers or whatever whatever your little uh, motivations that it'll give you allows these companies to get so much more data about you. If they can give you better recommendations and maybe even uh, tie that into this, the way ITV works is a lot of TV guide stuff. So if you gave you an alert, hey, I've noticed you've been watching Sons of Anarchy Season 5. Are you aware that Season 6 is on now on you know, 10, 10 o'clock? That's useful. Yeah, that I kind like of thing, that. that kind of technology working together that could drive eyeballs to watching live TV because if I'm watching stuff on Netflix, I don't, I have no idea what network for the most part or what time these shows are on. So if it could tie into that where it actually increases live viewership, that's how I see this actually sussing out in the long run because I'd get an alert on my phone saying, hey, this is on. And I might actually turn on the, uh, the television with that because it maybe it ties into a smart TV app that can turn on my uh, actual Xbox or my cable box or whatever it would be. Well, the key to that is to build in those services so that they are useful and they are working properly as quickly as you possibly can. Because uh, while the gamification attracts people, I only I think it only keeps a tiny percentage of the overall audience uh, after a certain number of months. I know that uh, initially when Foursquare was doing all the points and everything, I was obsessed with making sure I checked in all the time. And now I check in if I remember to. It's not, you know, I don't feel compelled to do it. The the reward systems are not nearly as uh, relevant to me. So I think it's one of those things where it, 
it's great to get people in the door, but if you don't have that kind of uh, interoperability where the services are really alerting you to things that are truly useful, then it ends up not being a, a, a great draw in the long run. Key to all this stuff, in my opinion, is if you want to make a successful second screen app, you got to figure out what we actually want to use it for, not try to make us do things with it, which is what most of them have done up until now. Let's fire up the randomizer, shall we? Randomizer. Guys, 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 did you did you see World Zombie Day is going to bring out the living dead? I saw it on foxnews.com yesterday. Did you see that? Did you see that? No. Yeah, and there was no. also Stuff Yo and We... Oh, yeah. that apparently, was funny. Apparently a prototype uh, mock-up of the foxnews.com website accidentally got published to the live platform. These things happen at all kinds of websites all the time. Uh, that's why in your mock-ups, <laughs> you might want to be careful what kind of content you put in there. Thankfully, they didn't have any like you know, the president is dead or, or horrible things like that. It's just like those a placeholder that somebody yeah. wrote. I love yeah. it, though. That's, that's something I feel like we we might all have written. You know, it's like, ah, just let's put in a headline text and then something below just to see what the font size looks like. Oh, yeah. Wee, totally. stuff, yo. But, but don't they know by now you don't put in actual stuff because it's very easy to overlook it? Like, you put in, like, TK, TK, TK because that's your eyes instantly see that as Lorem, wrong and go, why would why I publish that? Lore. That's why you always have to have lorem ipsum. That's why you write yeah. that nonsense for yourself. For sure. So then when it does get leaked, you're like, oh, it got leaked, not having a zombie apocalypse. And if the <laughs> audience was paying attention, I hope they, I don't know how the audience took Look, it. Look, you know, I live in Atlanta where zombie apocalypses happen every day. So for me, it just was, you know, another sure, another yeah. day on the internet. So You didn't even notice. You're like, oh, yeah, of course. That, that yeah, I, can, I can look outside and see that, actually. So You probably can. <laughs> Whenever they're shooting, anyway. Yep. All righty. Let's find out what's really coming up on the calendar. Hey, Nokia's 6-inch Lumia 1520 is coming to AT&T on November 15th for $199. You know, I feel like I already said this, but Groupon earnings are tomorrow the 7th. Did okay. I say that they were like last week? Mm -hmm. Maybe it was Yelp. I don't know. Yeah. It wasn't Yelp. Hard to keep track. Because it was a company that in my head I was making fun of. Mm. And Groupon is one of those companies. <laughs> anyway, well, their now real we earnings are tomorrow. If by any chance I said that there were earnings last week. And Twitter's big IPO day is tomorrow as well. The company is, if you follow some of the people who are, you know, going to be ringing the bell on the NASDAQ, um, there's, a, or New York Stock Exchange, um, there's there's a lot of sort of like, wink, wink, we're all in New York. Nobody's really saying what. But, uh, but that's tomorrow. Kind of now a big day. Know. Shall we check the emails? Incoming message. Sure. We've got a message from Scott from Canada without the good Netflix, as he puts it. Hey, gang, I was listening to the show the other day, and Netflix was mentioned. Your guest, David Hewlett, mentioned that we have moved beyond waiting each week for a new episode of our favorite TV show. That got me thinking that a daily soap opera might be perfect for Netflix. They could easily publish a back catalog of a canceled soap, Guiding Light or As the World Turns, then start it up again, publishing daily. Cost could be an issue, but if the format was changed to a 30-minute show with fewer plot lines in the webisode style, it could work. In my mind, this could draw a new audience to Netflix and increase daily viewership since subscribers will want to tune in daily to get their fix. They may either log in early and watch another show or stay logged in to watch additional shows. Thoughts? Well, all my children and one life to live are on Hulu. That's, that's the Hulu's already doing this. Um, and... I think but it's, are they releasing I, daily on Hulu? Like, uh, as if they question. were releasing back in the day. Da daily or weekly. Yeah. They might be daily. I, I really don't know. So you could have a huge binge of 30 years of Guiding Light. And then like, you could get caught yeah. up on the new episodes right. daily. Which the would, problem, yeah. though, you guys aren't as much of soap opera experts as I am. I, I spent sure. my formative that. years watching them all. I watched and all my children growing up. the thing about soaps is that the storyline only changes slightly once every two weeks. So if you've got the whole catalog at your disposal, you don't want to watch every day because it's basically the same show over and over, and then they'll just have a slight cliffhanger on Friday. So yeah, I don't know if this is the best candidate for a for a big dump. So it's going to be more dramatic, like a CW well, and drama. Net, and Netflix is saying we don't want daily stuff. We don't want to do things that way. So I don't think they would do this anyway, even though it is an intriguing idea. Thanks for that. Got another email from Amber who says, your discussion of Google Helpouts me mentioned that, in fact, if you... The fact that if you need to be available five minutes after being contacted, if that's the case, 
And the service really isn't intended for single user advice giver, but instead for large corporations that have many possible experts to answer your question. I think this is probably going to end up being used as a replacement to all the websites that have a click here to contact a live representative. Instead of maintaining that system yourself, your business can pay Google a fee and have the infrastructure for queue management, video management, and small finance issues just taken care of for you. All you need to provide is the call center workers with knowledge of your product. The beta product is that anyone can help. The money maker would be call centers. The teens getting makeup advice for Sephora are beta testing the real product and giving Google real world examples of how well it works. I think that's one of the uses. Point. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I, I, I don't think it's the only one, though. I think Google is trying to make it slightly more open than that. So if, I, if I'm if i the guy on TV that used to sell the instructional DVDs on how to use your computer, that guy's probably going to use this thing, too, and then be able to make a make a living doing that because he can be available every five minutes. But I, I Amber, I think you're right. I think I think that is going to be a big chunk of what this is used for. Good emails. Thank you guys both. And thank you, John Strickland, uh, once again for joining us today. Let folks know what you're up to. You got any cool stuff in the works? I'm sure you do. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm my series Forward Thinking. We're well into. Uh, we just started season two, and uh, the latest episode went live today. It was all about gravity and space junk, and uh, so we're doing something new this season. We've got some in studio episodes, and we've got some episodes where you can see me in my studio at my office. Which is pretty exciting stuff. I, I like the changing it up. So it's two different approaches to the same series. Uh, go check that out. We also have a, an audio podcast that's a companion to the video series. And there's a great website where you can check out all the uh, the other information, blog posts, things like that. I'm really proud of it. This has been a, a, an evolving project over the last year. And I can't believe how quickly it's scaled up. So if you haven't seen it, go check that out. Do check it out. FWthinking.com. Thank you, John Strickland. Also, don't forget, folks, uh, about our Twit survey going on right now. We want to know what you think. Make Twit even better. Go to twit.tv slash survey. Also, don't forget about our subreddit at technewstoday.reddit.com where you can submit stories and email us, tnt at twit.tv. Give us a call, 260-TNT-SHOW. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash technewstoday. And, of course, subscribe to the podcast, get the show notes and everything else at our website, twit.tv slash TNT. We'll be back tomorrow with Paul Spain from New Zealand as our guest. We'll see you then. He'll see you from the future.